Hi, I'm Dr. Matthias Norvig, expert on pre-Christian Scandinavian mythology and religion at the University of Colorado Boulder, and this is the Nordic Mythology Channel. I'm currently standing at the Bora Mounds in Norway, where we have the uh, heavy metal festival Midgardsblot happening right up here, and uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, drunken heavy metal people walking uh, by in the background, uh, so hopefully that won't disturb us too much. We also have sheep over here in the corner that also make some noise here and there. Um, but the most important thing is that I'm standing here next to Dr. Terry Gunnell of the University of Iceland, um, where he is a professor of uh, folkloristics and also an expert on the performance of Eddic poetry. Terry, thank you for joining me on the channel. Okay. So um, I'd like to hear a little bit about what is uh, Eddic poetry, uh, how is it performed, like what is the performance of Eddic poetry? Well, Eddic poetry basically to start off with is, is um, these are poems about the gods and about the old Norse heroes. They're the materials that people in later times used as sources when they were writing about old Norse religion and, and the past in Scandinavia. So these poems are that, um, what we need to remember. What I'm trying to what we're trying to argue when we talk about performance is that most people read them in printed out printed ink uh, on on paper in books and they talk about manuscripts with this material on and they talk about his literature um, <laughs> there you go, <laughs> there you go. and, and the, the, the key thing that needs to be remembered is that this material most people agree is something that's been passed on from probably pre-Christian times at least around the year 1000 until it gets written down in about 1270 or 1220 if we take Snorri um, in between that time, this has been passed on orally because writing doesn't exist in Scandinavia at that time, and this means also that this material was composed orally. Um, it was not composed with writing in mind. Whoever composed it was therefore thinking, first of all, not about the words and the shape of the words on paper, they were thinking more about the way the words sounded. And anybody in the oral tradition uh, is thinking about not just somebody, re not, they're not even thinking about somebody reading a text, they're thinking about somebody experiencing a text, somebody who hears a poem performed, and that, that means that you, it's, the radio doesn't exist at that time, so you're also, you're not only hearing it, you're watching it, and you're watching it in a particular surroundings, which may be on grave mounds like we have around here, or it may be in a hall somewhere. But it certainly means that this material is something that is uh, the way that it was conceived and thought about initially is not the way that it's been preserved nowadays. It's been also passed on and preserved for other reasons than it was composed. It's been passed on because it was historical and because it was poetic. But initially these poems are composed to, um, to pass on a, a myth, to bring the gods to life in the surroundings, um, to, uh, as part of a ritual of some kind. And we need to sort of go back to that if we really want to understand what these works really were initially. Okay, so uh, what you're saying is that we we need to go back to the um, the, the sort of the oral and aural mm. form of, of the poetry to understand what they're really about. How do we do that? Well, first of all, um, we have to realize that what we've got now, of course, uh, isn't necessarily the way the material was initially, but nonetheless, we need to remember that it's basically at heart a recording of something that was performed in some way or another, maybe performed privately, but initially performed for a large audience in a hall. So how do we go about doing that? First of all, we need to, um, it needs to be, you need to read it aloud. Mm -hmm. um, not just read it on paper, but read it aloud as it may have sounded initially. And, and while the vowels might have changed a little bit, the, the um, the consonants would have stayed the same. Mm -hmm. And when you read it aloud, especially a work like Vörospel, you suddenly realize um, that the, the guy in question, or girl perhaps, who composed this was actually thinking of sound. Mm -hmm. I can give you a little bit of an example here if I can remember these poem, these bits of the poem. Um, the beginning of it about the creation of the earth is very, very soft. Sort of, uh, out of our, I've, got, I've got a chorus here <laughs> at the back. Aur var alda þar í mér byggði og ég sandur og ég sæir og ég svala unnir and you can hear in a sense the waves coming in the, the stress on the S's the, the idea, of, it's a very soft sound um, but when you get for example later on to, to Ragnarök in, in, in Vörðspá 
um, you, you can hear the sound of the wolf growling at the back in, in, in texts like sort of, if I can remember this correctly too, Geir garmu mjög fyrir gripa hedli, festur minn slitna en freki renna, fjöld veit hún fræða fram sig lengra um ragna rök ramsig tífa. Yes, they're chosen yeah. to have the, the R's there. Mm -hmm. You get another place where, where they're talking about the end of the world when everything is fallen to pieces and, and everybody's fighting each other, um, which again goes for a totally special sound. Um, Bræði munu berjast og bönum berðast, munu systrum gasivjum spilla. Hart er í heimi, hordómur mikill. Skeggöld, skálmöld, skildir er í klopnir, vindöld, vargöld, á the veröld steypist. And again, you've got this bee banging sound, you've got the sound of the shield and swords and the, the roaring of the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So this, this um, whoever composed this poem meant it to be heard. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing to consider beyond that is, okay, um, who is it performed for, who is it, what, what sort of audience comes out of it. In the case of Wurlisbau, it's, it's uh, an audience of warriors for whom women are a bit of a threat. That mm -hmm. brings us back to a sort of uh, warrior hall in one form or another. Um, certainly the performance in a hall, which we know more and more about uh, Viking halls, archaeology will tell us about the surroundings and the way a performer can draw on the surroundings to, to build their story up. We have this sort of idea that the hall was a sort of uh, microcosmos where the, the ceiling held up by dwarfs um, is like the sky mm -hmm. and then coming down from this you have the pillars, the high, especially the high seat pillars where the chieftain sits in the middle, almost like three roots and then a single figure with carvings either side. You have to remember as well that in front of him is going to be a sort of um, a, a pot with water in it because you need to have hot water going most of the time and suddenly you've got the roots of the tree the sky above and the well in front of us a little bit like a church has of course the, the well the, for, for christening mm -hmm. and the tree in the shape of the cross these basic features which a performer can then draw on to make use of in his performance and we've got other things like masks we've got the, the Sutton Who mask for example which um, as Neil Price has underlined you put this helmet on on the front of your face and first of all it, it blackens out the eyes nobody can see the person inside it in a dark room one of the eyes lights up in darkness so in a sense you get a one-eyed person but no eyes inside and the voice is then changed as well and then echoed mm -hmm. somebody puts this on in that hall space starts speaking the words of the god because these poems many of them are monologues or dialogues so the god speaks in the present here I am here in Valhut or something of this kind and suddenly changes the room um, and when you have the mask on at the same time you have fire and you have um, uh, shadows and smoke and alcohol this is the experience of, of an old Norse poem and that's what the performer was well aware of when they started right um, and especially those poems which are composed in, as monologues where in a sense rather than just talking about the past and things that happened like a story the god actually enters the room and says i hung on the cross i hung on the tree for nine nights i was stabbed as a as a as, a, as an offering to myself in a sense elvis has entered the room elvis yeah. has <laughs> entered the room in, in, in the shape of Odin. yes okay and so that means then also that the performer uh, if we speak strictly in in, in context of ritual mm -hmm. Uh, then the performer would take on the role of Odin, for instance, in the, if they were performing a, 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 a poem like Grimnismal, yeah. where we have the, the figure is sit, situated between fires and drinks and then starts speaking this mm -hmm. uh, numinous wisdom. Mm -hmm. In first person, it says, I, I've, I've been between these fires for, for eight nights, uh, yeah. suggesting this is, this is now the ninth night. Um, and, and it's it's like drama. It's it's spoken as a monologue. Of course, these are only certain poems, but the it's a particular type of poem that we find in the Eddic collection, which are very much, which almost seem to work very much like dramas. Whoever's decided that they've just made a decision, I'm going to do this in first person, which means whatever performer is doing it is br is bringing the god to life in the room. Right. Yes. And do we also have indications of? Um, uh, for instance, uh, scene uh, breaks, or now we're entering a new scene, 
uh, as opposed to the, the earliest scene. And such. Again, we, yeah, we have that the, the if we look at performance, and my background's in drama, and when I wrote my thesis, it was uh, as a performer, can I perform these particular poems without going into drama? Can I just perform them and everybody understands what I'm saying? Can I just stand there and talk? What do I have to actually become character? Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, the two sites that we have coming out of these are certainly the hall site. Many of the poems take place in a hall, like the hall of Vathrudnir, for example, or, mm -hmm. or the hall of, 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 um, of Geira, that in the case of Grimnismar. And they were performed in a hall, which suggests that the, the space is being transformed into something else. People would see the connection. This is, is this hall, uh, like, like in a theatre, mm -hmm. transformed into something else. Other ones, like like um, Skirtnismal, for example, the story of of Skirtnir, who was sent to try and win over the the um, Jurten lady, Gerdud, for the god for the god Freyr. And that poem and Fapnismal, another one, have a very interesting movement pattern outside, where you it seems to go from inside and in a sort of male area um, across an area outside to a very female area where she's surrounded by fire um, and, and at, at where a sort of initiation ritual takes place, a giving of a cup and, and an acceptance. That seems to, to move across space and it's the movement in Skidnismal, for example, is like in a Shakespeare play um, where a character says, now we are going from this place to the next. It's what happens in Shakespeare's plays, they say, okay, here's my army, now we're going to walk across to France yeah. and, and, and the audience follows. Medieval drama as well was it wasn't done, done in a theatre, it was done out on the street, and very often you've moved from one space to the next. The audience goes from one to the next. So in a sense, those poems seem to demand that the audience travels from inside to somewhere like a grave mound on the outside, um, where a particular sort of ritual takes place of acceptance, um, a, a manhood of some kind. And then maybe to another place, like like a holy grove, as happens in Skidnismo. So it's a different sort of work, but it certainly connects the civilized area with the wild area on the outside, the male area with the female area on the outside, um, connecting the two together. Um, in a sense, the need to go to the female area to for the initiation to take place, the need to go out into nature for this to take place, and ideally, in this case happening at night time in both cases and ending at sunrise as the sun comes up, another sort of holy point, time of change. Okay. So these take us back into, it would seem to take us back if we look at how they might have worked from this performance archaeology view, viewpoint, till it, it gives us some insight into how they might have worked. Okay, and so what, would that then mean that these poems, uh, um, the, the ones that take place in the hall, they are, uh, could we sort of like link those to particular rituals in the hall and the ones that take place outside of the hall is that, are they linked to another type of ritual or or uh, would it <laughs> make sense at all to link all of them to the mm -hmm. ritual yeah I, I, there seems to be a sort of ritualistic background the the the, the name leol the hunter for this sort of verse leol's really means sort of magic chant, magic activity. Magic is something that's both done and said. It involves action and action and sound. So whoever, in a sense, recorded these poems was aware that they were associated with some form of magic, um, that they were meant to do something, um, and not just they weren't just stories. And this, and, and in the case of the whole rituals, it seems to, there's a lot of discussion about this. It seems maybe to be a, a sort of initiation of a new ruler, as some scholars have talked about. In the case of Skirtnismal, it sounds a little simplified, but nonetheless it does seem to have something to do with with um, the fertility of the earth, at least the idea of the sun god and earth being connected in some form or another. Could it be marriage too? I wouldn't even, in the case of Skidnismal, I would never use the word marriage. <laughs> <laughs> it's, far too, it's far too violent. Um, Snorri calls it marriage. Yeah. Sort of marriage of earth and, earth and sky. I mean, but, She's not interested. Right, um, right. But, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, in modern times, we have a very different perspective on what marriage is, right? 
Um, I, I was wondering if it, if it could be... It's a be, joining. It's let's a joining. It, let's yes. put it that way. It's a yeah. nice way to put it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a joining of, of earth and sky. I mean, it's talked about as, as being, at the end of the poem, Lunge Nocht, this is not a Danish or an Icelandic night. This is, a, it's, it's, if, it's, if it's a long night, it's midwinter. Yes. So we yes. have some element there Okay, again. so it's a natural uh, It's a sort of process. natural thing. It's a connection again between the civilized area and the wild area. Okay, okay. And yeah. it ends up by suggesting that, okay, let's, let's head off. We're gonna, they're going to head off to the grove together. They're going to head off to the grove <laughs> together. <laughs> and just it's wait for the next exciting episode. And that, Yeah, exactly. And that's also very interesting that you, uh, that you say, sort of rule out the uh, idea of marriage or sort of like a love union because mm -hmm. I mean we isn't it also in the beginning of this poem that we see that Freyr he's he does not fall in love as Snorri says he it's, it's he other things he fancies this lady that yes he's, he's seen from a distance <laughs> yes uh, yeah, and, and everything just stops because he fancies her yes yeah. yes so so we're dealing with another type of situation yes <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> All right, Terry, thank you very much for joining me here thank on the you. channel. Yeah. Um, and thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook.